Welcome to this series of supply chain lectures. I'm Johannes Vermoel, and today I will be presenting cybersecurity for supply chain. Modern supply chains are extensively driven by software, and increasingly so every passing day. Yet, while software comes with great benefits, such as higher productivity or higher reactivity, software comes with severe drawbacks. Software comes with its own set of problems, and among those, computer security is its own entire class of problems, which can prove to be exceedingly costly. Yet, for supply chain, there is no going back to a pre-software era. It is not possible anymore to operate profitably a large-scale supply chain without software. Thus, computer security needs to be addressed frontally. The first goal for this lecture will be to understand the extent and the magnitude of the computer security challenge, and in particular from a supply chain perspective to understand what it takes to secure a supply chain, a modern supply chain. The second goal for this lecture will be to understand what makes computer security so unique and so challenging because it is deeply counterintuitive. And again, in particular from a supply chain perspective, to understand what makes um, the sort of insights that are applicable to, um, um, to computer security so uh, uh, adverse to the sort of common wisdom that is prevalent in most supply chain circles. Cybercrime has been on the rise for over a decade. The FBI uh, provides very interesting statistics um, about cybercrime. And last year, the reported losses uh, in the USA um, for cybercrime uh, amount, uh, amounted to uh, over $4 billion. And um, although those numbers probably underestimate uh, the extent of the problem, indeed, Companies, uh, for, for various set of reasons, are likely to you know, under-report the, the, the problems. First, um, we have the small-scale incidents, um, which are particularly ha hard to assess and quantify. For example, if um, you lose half a day of warehouse operation in one warehouse because uh, of a very minor um, uh, computer security breach, this is hardly the type of incident that is going to warrant uh, an actual, I would say, report and, and, and damage claim, although there was some real damage. And then, um, so that's for the small scale incident. And then at the other hand of the spectrum, um, large scale incidents tends to be underreported by large companies, uh, if only to avoid causing a market pa panic if the, the company happens to be publicly traded. Thus, large scale incidents tend to be minimized. Thus, however, the most important and I think uh, interesting figures of those reports is the uh, annual growth of those reported losses, which is at um, roughly 30%. And the, re the figures given by the FBI show that these numbers have been very stable over the last five years. So we have 30% uh, year-to-year growth uh, in terms of reported losses. And my personal take on the case is that um, this growth is very likely to remain stable in terms of, 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 of growing trend for the decade to come. Indeed, um, there, I would say the um, the importance of software is still steadily growing uh, and our modern economy is still um, getting even more dependent on software. And thus, I, I suspect that this trend will keep growing for something like a decade before reaching a plateau. Now, cybercrime is big uh, and, uh, and getting bigger. However, it is not the end of the world also. And just to, uh, especially when we compare this to the magnitude of other problems. For example, if we assume one decade of steady plus 30% annual growth, cybercrime in terms of reported losses would reach something uh, like $50 billion annual in the USA. 
uh, which would make um, the, the scale of this problem about one third of the uh, illegal drug market. So this is a big problem, but this is not exactly an, uh, uh, an uh, I would say, an apocalypse level sort of problem, and especially when we compare this figure to um, the GDP of the USA. Uh, nevertheless, it is a problem that is becoming um, serious enough to warrant uh, a, a, a very dedicated attention, especially since most of this cost is actually bared by the actors who are paying the least attention. So this cost is not evenly distributed. And uh, my take is that su supply chains being particularly exposed are you know, bearing a bit, big portion of this cost, um, uh, higher than the rest of the economy. And in this portion, the companies who are paying the least attention are actually um, supporting the bulk of the cost. In order to create a computer security problem, you can compromise machines, you can compromise people, or you can compromise actually a mixture of machines and people. Um, the techniques that take advantage of people are technically known as social engineering technique. Um, and that's, that's very interesting because um, social engineering techniques can be incredibly uh, efficient at taking advantage of um, computer security problems. However, social engineering would deserve a lecture of its own and today the goal of this lecture is to really focus on the computer part of the problem. And indeed, um, supply chains are very exposed, pretty much by design. First, supply chains uh, involve tons of machines. Second, supply chains involve tons of machines that are geographically distributed. Third, by design in supply chains, um, those machines are incredibly interconnected and interdependent. And lastly, in supply chain, there are tons of people involved, which means that the applicative landscape is going to be very complex, and where there is complexity to be found, there is also fragility to be found uh, in terms of computer security. And thus, in total, supply chains have all the ingredients to be prime targets for um, computer security problems. And if it wasn't complicated enough, uh, I would like to immediately point out that um, uh, computer, computer security is typically conflicting with other types of security. And thus, improving the situation on the computer security front may actually create other types of security problems. To illustrate this aspect, which might be uh, quite counterintuitive, Let's have a look, for example, at the situation, at the case of a data lake. Um, if you introduce a data lake in which you gather all your um, supply chain data, then you create a single point of failure where if there is one uh, uh, breach in this data lake and if there is an intruder that can manage to compromise this uh, data lake, then this one intruder, this one attacker, will be able to exfiltrate all the data at once. And this is something that is by design. If you have a data lake, it means that you are creating a single point of failure. There is no workaround. This comes by design with the very notion of a data lake. However, um, though a data lake is going to increase our computer security problems. However, if we don't have a data lake, then um, the company is exposed to another class of problems. Indeed, most corporate frauds rely on the fact that uh, typically in a large organization, the right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing. And this lack of communication, etc., lack of communication, lack of synchronization within the company can, uh, is, um, can be used to a great extent to commit all sorts of frauds. And one way to mitigate all those problems consists of putting all the data together so that um, those sort of frauds becomes much more evident just because all the pieces have been put together. And thus, in this regard, having a data lake is, uh, can be a great way to mitigate all sort of, of fraud that would otherwise go unnoticed just because um, the data can be, cannot be recouped. 
Thus, uh, thus, what we can see here is that having the data lake creates a computer security problem, but it is also part of the solution to avoid all sorts of fraud that can also be very, very costly for the company. And thus, um, uh, we see here that um, computer security is all about trade-off, not only trade-off between the sort of, of costs that are involved with um, the security mechanism, but trade-off with other kinds of security that are going beyond the specific scope of, uh, of, uh, of computer security. This lecture is the seventh lecture of this fourth um, chapter uh, about supply chain. And this fourth chapter is dedicated to the auxiliary sciences of supply chain. And auxiliary sciences represent um, sciences or topics that are not exactly supply chain, but that, that are topics that are, I believe, fundamental to a modern practice of supply chain. And since we started this fourth chapter, we have been going up the ladder of abstraction. We started with um, the, the literally the physics of computing. Um, then we moved toward the mo to, to software with the most basic element of software, namely algorithms. Then we went into um, two specific type of fairly elaborate algorithms, namely mathematical optimization and machine learning, which are of key interest for supply chain. And in particular, we have seen that those, those two topics that are of key interest, when we approach them in a, in a, from, I would say, a modern perspective, then both mathematical optimization and machine learning prove to be driven by uh, programming paradigms. And thus, we did a detour uh, through uh, the lecture um, languages and uh, compilers um, which is probably one of the most underappreciated topic in supply chain circles as far as computer knowledge goes. And uh, finally, in the last lecture, we delve into um, software engineering, uh, focusing on leaving the machines behind for a while and focusing on the people that uh, end up creating the software that it takes to run a supply chain in the first place. And today, after focusing on what it takes to create the software that is needed by um, your supply chain to operate, we are going to focus on what it takes to destroy this uh, and disable this, so this very software that um, should make your um, supply chain operate. The rest of this lecture will be essentially will follow uh, in three blocks. First, we will review three key concepts that are of interest to even apprehend um, computer security. Indeed, what I said that computer security is um, deeply counterintuitive, uh, it doesn't mean that computer security is impervious to uh, rationality and, uh, and logical you know, analysis. I'm just stating the fact that it's um, pretty much more difficult by design. Second, we will analyze the, uh, and list a series of very common root causes behind uh, many, if not most, computer security problems nowadays. And um, in particular, we'll see that it's difficult not to feel um, overwhelmed considering, I would say, the, the sheer scope of the root causes for, um, uh, for computer security problems. And lastly, we will have a look at what can be done to, uh, at the very least, mitigate those uh, computer security woes. And we will see that most of the, the knowledge that is to be found, I would say, on, on the positive side, on, on the side of what can be done, is of the type of negative knowledge. So it's not, it's not so much emphasizing what should be done, but rather what is to be, to be avoided. I will try to cover all those topics from um, a supply chain perspective. However, there are many aspects that are not incredibly supply chain specific as far as uh, computer security is concerned. In order to think about, um, about a solution, we need 
to first clarify what is it the problem that we are trying to solve in the first place. This is the exact line of thinking that I had for the whole uh, third chapter of this series, this, this chapter which is dedicated to the supply chain personnel. Indeed, the supply chain personnel really try to uh, crystallize the very problems that we are trying to solve. And in computer security, there is a loose equivalent under the form of the threat model. The threat model is literally uh, a tool to crystallize the sort of, of problem that we are trying to fix security-wise. Indeed, uh, computer security is fairly elusive and vague and diverse. It is very, very difficult to reason about, um, about computer security. And when having a discussion about security, it is very difficult to not suffer the problem of moving goalposts through the discussion, even if the people who are taking part to the discussion have, um, uh, I would say, are, are doing so in good faith. And thus, for example, uh, for example, if we are discussing um, the, 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 the threat of having uh, a password made public by an employee, um, which is, uh, by the way, uh, um, easier than it seems, even if the employee is not, is not rogue, it's just all it takes is just to actually reuse the password. The discussion should not deviate if we are discussing the threat of having one pa password being public, being exposed publicly. The discussion should not deviate on, I would say, other type of threats such as having uh, weak passwords or, uh, or, or, I would say, common passwords. Thinking clearly about a threat is essential in computer security because um, I would say a poorly conceived remediation to a given problem tend to be worse than the original problem. If I, if I, want to, if I were to, to continue my, my previous example about, uh, about passwords, if, for example, thinking about this, this problem about exposed passwords, uh, a company were to decide that in order to um, to limit this problem, uh, the company would proceed to uh, with disciplinary actions taken against employees who are found, you know, um, uh, who are found guilty of having, you know, disclosed their password. Um, this this sort of approach, you know, taking disciplinary action would most likely severely backfire, uh, if only because if you start doing that instead of having. Uh, uh, um, uh, what, what will most likely happen is that people would start con um, concealing the, the problem that they face with their, their password, uh, with their passwords, and thus instead of coming, uh, of coming to you asking for support, they would start doing what they can to actually uh, hide the problem, making it worse on the long run. Also. The interesting thing about threat models is that it is fundamentally, uh, it forces you fundamentally to choose your battles, to choose the threats, to, 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 um, to choose the threats that you're going to address and the one that you're not going to address, even if the threat is real. For example, let me state the following threat. Uh, what about uh, a rogue employee that happens to be, uh, um, to, to have a high privilege access to the data lake what would happen if this person were to exfiltrate data from uh, the data lake, leverage, leveraging uh, his or her um, high privileges? This is a threat. But um, do you decide to actually combat this specific threat or not? Indeed, um, you have limited resources, limited time. And uh, as, I, uh, as I stated my threat, I'm talking about uh, a, an employee having high privileges. Uh, Addressing this very specific threat can prove to be incredibly costly. And thus, um, the threat modeling is also to decide that at some point, you know, there are some threats that are just too costly to address, where it would be the, the resources and the time that you have would be better addressed, spent on uh, addressing other type of threats which, are, which can be as threatening, but just much cheaper and easier to address. Um, in this regard, Beware of analogies. The sort of threats that you face in computer security are completely unlike the sort of threats that you face, let's say, in terms of industrial risk or you know, physical risk. 
Um, computer security involve adversaries, people who can bad people who can think and adapt what they are doing, you know, the, the, uh, to your own um, practices and, and even policies. For example, if you have uh, a well well documented security processes, then an attacker could actually take advantage of this existing documentation to identify the blind spots that you have. Uh, my point is not that you should not have uh, any documentation with regard to security. My point is that it, when it comes to computer security, the adversaries are smart and can take advantage of whatever you give them, even if it's your own security processes. And thus, threat modeling really helps to start thinking about those sort of problems. Now, uh, in the physical world, the attack surface is something that is relatively obvious. If we were to think about, for example, a medieval castle, the attack surface, if there is an army attacking, you know, storming the castle, the attack surface is relatively clear. It's going to be the walls of the castle and the drawbridge. However, in the computer world, the situation is much, much more muddy. And if I were to, again, take my uh, analogy with uh, a medieval castle, um, the, the computer security equivalent uh, would be that uh, in terms of computer security, the spoons that are in storage in a drawer in the kitchen of the castle could maybe potentially suddenly explode uh, and, and create a breach in the wall of the medieval castle. You see, there is, uh, when it comes to computer security, there is no such thing as obvious um, uh, attack surface. Everything can, uh, can be attacked. And thus, the one key intuition about attack surface is that it's, it's always greater than you think. And if you are looking for one <laughs> real world terrifying example of that, you can have a look at the OMG cable, the oh my god cable that you can see on the screen. It really, this piece of hardware um, looks like a completely regular um, USB cable. However, um, this very, this OMG cable comes with a, a, a microcomputer inside that would let you uh, compromise any computer of your choosing by just plugging the cable on the computer. And um, by the way, this is a fairly uh, inexpensive piece of hardware since uh, you can even buy this sort of things. It comes in all sorts of colors and sizes for just $139 which I personally found um, exceedingly cheap for something that would not even be completely out of place in a, in a James Bond movie, actually. And thus, yeah, you have to think that in terms of attack surface, every single piece of hardware and software uh, has its own attack surface. How, no matter how seemingly insignificant this element might appear. Um, and furthermore, in the specific case of supply chain, I would like also to mention that uh, it is very, very difficult to even identify all the attack surfaces. Indeed, um, shadow IT, which is prevalent in, uh, I would say, in, in the world of supply chain, and um, um, uh, employee-owned devices, you know, this, uh, this bring your own device sort of, of, of patterns, are um, as many, you know, entry points for an attacker into your supply chain. So it's not just what is uh, managed by um, the IT team. It's also all the things that are not managed by your IT team, but that happens to be contributing one way or another to the operations of your supply chain. Now, um, the idea about the attack surface is to clarify what can be, ex uh, what can be attacked, not, not focusing on how the attack can be performed. You know, it, it, Conceptually, the interesting thing about the idea of attack surface is that it, it forces you to uh, create some kind of mapping of all the sort of elements that can be compromised one way or another. And by the way, um, again, from a, um, a, a specific supply chain perspective, any kind of software with programmable capabilities, um, so that can be Excel spreadsheets or Python scripts 
comes with an uh, absolutely massive uh, attack surface if the programmability or the extensive comparability um, is done with a generic programming language. Thus, uh, and uh, thus, as far as supply chain is concerned and considering the amount of, of configuration that is going on, the attack surface is typically quite massive. Now, we have, as a, as, a, as a third concept, we have the blast radius, which is a way to measure the total potential impact of a security event. It, and when you start thinking in terms of blast radius, we don't, you don't ask yourself um, uh, if this event is going to happen. You just start thinking yourself, when it does happen, so what? So you see, this is the idea is that you start thinking, you try to think about, uh, I don't care about all the remediation that I have in place. I start thinking, if wh when this thing happens, and it will happen, what will be the actual blast radius of the problem? And again, if I go back to my uh, um, castle analogy, medieval castle analogy, uh, the blast radius when it comes to computers, to the world of computers, can be incredibly large, surprisingly so. Uh, if I was, I was describing you know, the spoons that are in storage in a drawer in the kitchen, that those spoons can blow off, uh, can, can explode and destroy the castle, but the, the, the true uh, or, or more correct computer analogy would be that not only those spoons can explode, but they can literally level a few neighboring tones beyond the castle itself, and that's exactly the sort of problems that happens, by the way, in, uh, in, in the real world. Um, for example, the colonial, in the case of the colonial pipeline attack, it was just, the, the compromise system was just a tiny part of the system. It was merely the, the billing system, something that was not even truly contributing to the daily operation. And the actual blast radius of having the, 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 the billing system of a, of a single company was the entire state of Texas. You know, that gives you the sort of idea of what is the actual blast radius of, um, of uh, computer security problems when you start thinking about supply chains. Now, with the advent of um, cloud computing, I must point out that blast radiuses have, uh, expanded, did expand enormously. Indeed, um, while cloud computing is extremely competitive, both as a business model and as an IT operational model, um, cloud computing comes with massive blast reduces indeed, because it becomes possible for an attacker, if this attacker gains some kind of administrative control over your cloud computing resources, then this uh, attacker can literally undo all your applicative scan, uh, landscape at once. So you've, you've created through uh, clouds a s single point of failure that, have, um, that are incredibly far-reaching. Also, um, the very fact that you are moving apps in the cloud um, tend to exacerbate another problem. As I said, uh, in terms of blast radius, the more interconnected the apps tends to be, the bigger and the larger the blast radius tends to be. And uh, wh when you move apps in the cloud, what you gain is, uh, uh, I would say, an ease to interconnect this app that has just been moved to the cloud with other apps that are also in the cloud. There are real business benefits of having this, all those interconnection. However, it means that uh, from in terms of blast reduces, you are creating massive interdependencies that can be leveraged to, uh, for an attacker to generate a blast radius of uh, an absolutely staggering size. And for example, in terms of supply chain, uh, thinking about the blast radius is a, a good way to think about ways to mitigate you know, those blast radius. If we go back to another supply chain example, let's consider um, that, as I was describing in the previous lecture, in supply chain, we have basically two types of, uh, of software uh, elements. We have the transactional elements, uh, for example, keep it, keeping track of stock levels, 
and then which are basically the supply chain management per se and then we have all the analytical elements um, the supply chain optimization which involves you know the forecasting planning and all of those sort of statistical uh, analysis of the data if we decide in um, to keep all the software elements that are of a analytical nature strictly isolated from production so that um, the analytics part of your applicative scan landscape can actually read the data from the transactional systems but never write anything into those transactional systems. It means that if you, uh, when the analytical systems will be compromised, the blast radius will be contained to uh, the analytical part of your applicative landscape and and thus it means that if you your more, more bluntly if your forecasting software is compromised it doesn't compromise your um, the piece of software that is actually keeping track of your stock levels now let's let's review all um, the root causes uh, and the sources of computer security woos. Security-wise, the um, state of affairs uh, in terms of computer hardware is, um, is absolutely terrible. In short, the barrel is leaking all over the place and, uh, and, and basically the entire community keeps applying duct tape to hastily fix all the problems that are constantly emerging. And literally, everything hardware-wise is kind of broken nowadays. For example, all modern CPUs are pretty much broken. Um, in 2018, uh, a team of security researchers uh, uh, unveiled two new classes of, um, of vulnerabilities in, uh, on, on, modern, uh, on modern CPUs uh, named Spectre and Meltdown. Essentially, those vulnerabilities take advantage of um, the predictive branch prediction capabilities that are found in modern CPUs. Uh, as you may recall, for the part of the audience that, did, uh, that, did, uh, that were present in the very first lecture of this fourth chapter, the one where I discuss about modern, uh, modern um, computing uh, for, for, for supply chain, uh, we have seen that modern CPUs have uh, very deep execution pipelines and that one of the way to have, I would say, highly performant CPUs is to do branch prediction. Well, it turned out that this branch prediction mechanism, which is found in basically every single modern CPU of the market, can be taken advantage of to breach boundaries, especially modern boundaries. And they are, it is actually a situation that is very, very difficult to solve because fundamentally that is uh, a, a sort of defect that, co that goes with the very design of having branch prediction in those CPUs in the first place. And thus, um, thus essentially, we have, uh, we have CPUs that have tons of problems, and I am not even mentioning what you can see on the screen, which are um, literally CPUs that have accidental backdoors just because they end up having to support a lot of, of legacy. Now, CPUs are broken, but it turned out that, that memories are broken. Um, indeed, there is a, a, a class of attacks called the raw hammer attack that take advantage of um, the physical layout of modern memory cells as they are found in high-density modern DRAM. Essentially, it is possible to trigger uh, memory errors and, uh, and to take advantage of those errors to exfiltrate data from, from the machines. There is no real workaround, even if you have ECC DRAM. Uh, ECC stands for um, Error Correction Codes, uh, which is a way to, uh, that it's typically the type of memory that is found uh, in the cloud, you know, on, on server grade, on, on production grade. Uh, um, uh, data center grade, you know, machines, you have, you have ECC. Even ECC is only merely slowing down the raw hammer attack. It cannot prevent the raw hammer attack. And all it takes to, uh, to you know, carry 
a raw hammer attack is basically to get the machine execute uh, a web page with JavaScripts enabled on this web page. And then you can directly exfiltrate data from the memory of the machine. Now, also, um, we have CPUs that are broken, the memory is broken, USB is broken, uh, pretty much all of it. Um, it is, when it comes to USB, it is safe to assume that any, any USB device that you connect to any of your own device uh, uh, can compromise, um, uh, compromise the, the connected device. Um, we did see an example with the, um, the Oh My God cable in a, in a previous slide, but fundamentally the problem runs very, very deep and um, the root cause is essentially very bad decisions that were made um, decades ago about, about USB, especially when it comes about plug and play. Um, for, from a, a user experience, uh, it is great that when you just plug a device into your computer that this device can just run out of the box, but what is happening under the hood is that there is tons of smart intelligence inside uh, the USB controller to basically auto-import drivers and auto-enable all sorts of features that can be used as as many entry points for an attacker to literally take control of your machine. Thus, uh, all those plug-and-play features are very nice from a user experience perspective, but they are a complete nightmare from a cybersecurity perspective. But by the way, um, most, I mean many, if not most, uh, Wi-Fi chipsets have also um, uh, turbo uh, security flows. Um, researchers in 2000 and, uh, 2017 uh, showed that, um, that um, chipsets produced by Broadcom that were widely used in both iPhone and Samsung phones uh, would uh, ha were flowed and um, all it took basically for an attacker to compromise the device was just literally to be within Wi-Fi range to remotely take control of, of the device. Uh, if the, if the Wi-Fi was active, that was all it took. Um, and thus, you see, from a supply chain perspective, we see that not only pretty much all the hardware, um, the conventional hardware is, is broken to a large extent, uh, but from a supply chain perspective, I would say that uh, the geographic distribution, which can be even further amplified if you have any kind of IoT uh, going on in your supply chain, uh, is, um, is subject to all of the problems that I've just described, but even more because an attacker very frequently can actually gain access physically to your, to your hardware, or at least it becomes, it is, if, if your hardware is geographically distributed, it is much more difficult to actually prevent all type of, uh, of access, physical access to any kind of device that might be at some point, you know, connected to your supply chain. Thus, supply chains are extremely exposed by design as far the hardware is concerned. And as we have seen that the state of affairs in terms of hardware security is turbo, it should not come as a, a great surprise that the state of affairs as far the software security uh, is concerned that for this state of affairs to be, um, to be completely terrible as well. Um, I'm not going to enumerate again all the sort of flaws that can be found uh, in software. Um, the key idea is that every single layer comes with its own computer security woos. Uh, we can talk about, we could talk about the operating system, the virtual machines, the hypervisor, the applicative framework, the web servers, um, um, you, you name it. All of those layers have an uh, entire series of severe um, computer security problems. However, the one thing that I would like to point out is that software-wise, even the sort of software pieces that are supposed to protect you uh, can actually sever severely backfire. And for example, uh, at present day, antiviruses represent usually uh, a whole uh, class of security problems. Uh, Indeed, an antivirus is a piece of software that operates with enormous privilege on the machine. You know, just because the antivirus is supposed to be able to scan what all the other processes are doing, 
uh, by necessity, the antivirus operate with enormous privilege, which means that this is a prime target for, uh, for an attacker. Moreover, um, the antivirus, if there is any, is going to be present on many, many machines in the company. So that's twice. So it's, it's the same software with very high privilege that happens to be present on many, many machines. This is really, really a prime target for an attacker. And guess what? Uh, a lot of attackers nowadays are directly targeting for uh, t targeting the antiviruses. This is, by the way, uh, what you can see on the screen was uh, security researchers that shows that essentially uh, how to compromise an existing antivirus of the market to use this antivirus to extract uh, data from the target. Also, but but the problems with uh, with antiviruses runs very very deep. You see, an antivirus is uh, a very is it's fundamentally uh, a very resource intensive sort of computation that has to be carried by antivirus. As a result, uh, it means that antivirus are uh, invariably involving a lot of programming voodoo, low level programming voodoo, to achieve the desired level of performance. Unfortunately, uh, the more low-level shenanigans you have in your software to achieve you know, great computing performance, the more uh, attack surface you get just because you expose yourself in terms of, uh, of, uh, of a whole set of, of uh, I would say, of low-level problems. Furthermore, and finally, um, antiviruses are by design um, software pieces that needs to constantly interact with the outside world. You know, uh, typically an antivirus is worth nothing if this antivirus doesn't constantly update itself with the latest set of signatures, the latest bit of logic on how to detect the most freshest kind of, of malware. And thus you end up with a piece of software that, uh, that also increase your, um, your, your attack surface just because uh, this um, this piece of software needs to connect itself to, uh, to the network, to plenty of other things. And um, my own personal take is that most antivirus solutions are doing more harm than good uh, in, uh, I would say, in the present day enterprise software market. But the reality is that pretty much almost the same can be said with most security solutions uh, in the past year. Um, um, for example, there, there were very severe worldwide issues where attackers did specifically attack some uh, security solutions just because those security solutions always tend to share the same sort of, of I would say, key characteristic than the antivirus, so high privilege, extensive reach, uh, high connectivity, and all of that make them prime targets for, uh, for an attacker. Thus, my, uh, if, if we want to, to conclude that from a, a supply chain perspective, I would like to point out that from a supply chain perspective, the sort of enterprise software that is prevalent in supply chain circles tends to be abysmal security-wise due to their sheer internal complexity. You see, uh, it is already difficult to secure a piece of software that is very thin and very lean when you are dealing with uh, very bloated products that have been constantly growing for decades, it becomes almost an impossibly challenging task. Um, and that's what makes, I would say, the sort of um, situation e even worse as far as supply chain software is concerned. And finally, um, supply chain attacks, which are of interest for at least two very distinct reasons. First, um, supply chain attacks are uh, very interesting because those attacks have grown massively during um, the course of the last few years. Actually, my own personal prediction would be that those uh, supply chain attacks will probably be in the next decade the, one of the dominant form of, uh, of, uh, of computer security attacks. And, but it's also of interest due to the presence of the supply chain keyword in the name of the attacks, which can generate a lot of confusion, especially when we are discussing with um, a supply chain audience. 
A supply chain attack is simply put an attack that attacks one of your software dependencies. Um, for example, attacking Amazon directly, the software produced by Amazon directly, might prove very difficult. Possibly, the teams at Amazon are very uh, uh, competent and their software is very well engineered and, uh, and there is not that many security flows to take advantage of. However, what about all the dependencies, so the piece of software that are used by Amazon, but that were not you know, created, engineered in the first place at Amazon? All of those elements are essentially, uh, and this is uh, the case, for example, with, uh, with open source software. So pretty much at present time, every single vendor is massively using uh, open source. Uh, you, can, you can name any of the, any large you know, uh, company nowadays, chances are they are extensively, extensively uh, leveraging bits of uh, open source software. And thus, if we go back to this Amazon case, what about if I cannot manage to compromise Amazon directly, what about compromising one of the, one of the components open source component that happened to be used by Amazon. And that's exactly the essence of a supply chain attack. And it turned out that last Friday, last Friday, uh, there was probably one of the biggest computer uh, security breach of the decade with um, the log4j uh, catastrophic vulnerability that was uncovered. So in, in short, log4j, is, uh, is an open source component uh, that is used to log errors. So essentially, software can have an error, and the idea is that you want to be able to backtrack errors uh, after, after the fact, and thus when an error occur, you just want to typically log this error, and that's the primary function of a, of a logger, such as um, log4j. And uh, log4j, is, the J stands for Java, and in, uh, I would say, uh, in the enterprise software world, um, Java is probably the uh, most, uh, is one of the dominant sort of software stack there is to be found. And for all the software that happens to be implemented in Java, um, the majority of the products needs a logger and the majority of the products are probably using uh, log4j at this point. It turned out that it was that uh, uh, a catastrophic, it was, it was classed as uh, 10 out of 10, you know, on a, on a 10 scale security uh, levels of, 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 uh, of security criticality, that there was a, a catastrophic vulnerability found last Friday on, uh, in log4j. And by the way, there was even, as, as this piece, specific piece of software went under a great large deal of scrutiny because there has been like um, large scale worldwide chaos that was, that were the, the repo of this one vulnerabilities, uh, a second critical vulnerability was found today. And this is really the essence of a supply chain attack is that uh, a small component seemingly in a curse, um, something that you probably never heard of, something that you've never even realized that you were dependent of, just happen to be to, to be at the core of, of your system and can create uh, a, a huge amount of chaos because these things that happen to be in the core of your system create vulnerabil vulnerabilities. And again, from a supply chain perspective, it turns out that supply chain is particularly vulnerable to supply chain attacks. Why is that? Um, it is the case because Modern supply chains are heavily interconnected. So you, most likely your company, if you're running a modern supply chain, is heavily connected in terms of software to both your suppliers and your clients. It can take the form of EDI, but it can take all sorts of forms with uh, computer integration between, uh, between companies. And thus, uh, in terms of supply chain attacks, it means that it's not just the dependencies, the software dependencies that you have, in order to attack you, chances are that all it takes is to actually compromise one of the dependency of one of your supplier or one of the dependency of one of your clients. You know, again, um, in terms of attack surface, supply chains have, uh, uh, have I would say, um, are very, very vulnerable by design and very exposed by design. Thus, so far, what we have seen is a fairly <laughs> 
bleak picture of, of the situation. And I believe this, this is an accurate de depiction of, I would say, prison day computer security. We really have tons of problems, and uh, I'm afraid that I will be discussing in, uh, in this last section what is there to be done about it. But, uh, but let me be clear, I believe that right now it is a, a, a very uphill battle and that an extremely difficult battle that you must be prepared to lose uh, once in a while just because this is very, very difficult. That doesn't mean that we should not try to do better in terms of security. And so let's try to start with the sort of common wisdom in terms of computer security. So again, the, the FBI has a, a top five recommendation in terms of computer security. Let's review those recommendations. The first recommendation is backup, test your backups and keep your backups offline. I believe that overall it's a good recommendation, however the uh, idea of keeping the backups offline is somewhat uh, unrealistic. It is very costly and very difficult. For a backup to be of any use, you need to do this backup very frequently. A backup that is one month old is typically of absolutely zero use. Um, thus, uh, if you are backupping you know, very frequently every day or possibly every hour or even every minute, uh, it becomes very, very difficult to have a truly offline backup. Thus, my suggestion would be keep your backup strictly isolated. And also when it comes to backup, the, the, I think, but that is outlined in the recommendation of the FBI, is test your backup, which means that you need to focus on quick recovery. What matters is not really to have a, a backup plan, but a recovery plan if your, um, your applicative landscape end up compromised. The second recommendation is use multi-factor authentication. Again, I believe this is a, a, a very good recommendation. It is clearly intended at um, the threat model of the password we use that I, I just outlined previously. Uh, essentially, um, uh, passwords are very, very insecure, but more generally, every single, uh, every, most of, I would say, the authentication methods when using, when you only have one element of security tends to, to have uh, severe uh, vulnerabilities. Um, and the, the one thing that I would like to point out is that um, the problem with multi-factor authentication is that very frequently you only have the illusion of having a multi-factor authentication. That's a key problem. Uh, indeed, what, what happens is that, for example, if you say that you have a password and a confirmation by phone, you could say, well, it's a two-factor authentication, except that if I can actually reset the password if I have the phone in my hand, then actually this is not a two-factor authentication, it's only a one-factor authentication because ultimately all it takes to compromise your account, your access, is the phone. Um, so with multi-factor, the one thing to keep in mind is to make sure that those factors are truly isolated and there is not like, it, it doesn't devolve into a one-factor authentication uh, because actually one factor happens to be, you know, over uh, overruling all the others. The third recommendation is update and patch your systems. Agreed, this is uh, a good practice. However, I would like to point out that um, um, too much of a good thing can actually become a bad thing. And for example, one of, of the most severe sort of problems that we have nowadays is our it are those supply chain attacks where we depend on automated software upgrades, you see? Because it means that suddenly if you have like automated updates in place, it means that if an attacker managed to carry a supply chain attacks where this attacker compromised a piece of open source software, and there are thousands of those somewhere, it means that by just letting the auto updates, you know, features take over, this piece of, um, of, I would say, um, of, of, of malware, it's going to make its way automatically into your systems. So that's, that's uh, something that is becoming increasingly, I would say, dangerous. And by the way, um, also, I, I didn't went into the details of the sort of security vulnerability that there is about USBs, uh, about USB. But, uh, however, most of the, the problems about 
uh, about USB, um, which is a hardware class of hardware, uh, comes from auto-update capabilities of this of the firmware. So, so again, I would say yes, update and patch, but uh, but you you need to always keep thinking about whether you're not creating an even bigger security problem. The fourth recommendation is make sure your security solutions are up to date. On this one um, recommendation. I'm not too sure. What is a security solution? Is it something um, sold by a security vendor? Um, for me, these lines, these recommendations, feels directly, li feels like being the direct product of some kind of lobbying effort from uh, a security company with regard to the FBI. And um, the problem being that most of what is nowadays advertised as security solutions are not really making um, your, your supply chain or even your company any more secure. Thus, I'm, I'm, I'm fairly skeptical about that, but, but again, if you have a piece of software, it is typically better to keep it up to date, whether it is a security solution or anything else. And the last, re the last uh, recommendation is review and exercise your incident response plan. This recommendation isn't really bad, but in my book, it wouldn't really make it to the top five. Um, not really, I don't think so. The, the, the problem that I have is that this sort of thinking, I believe, is much more appropriate to deal with industrial uh, uh, incidents. So, for example, if we are talking about the risk of fire, um, uh, carry on, ca carrying exercise of fire evacuation is, um, is the way to go. However, um, we are not dealing with industrial accidents here. Um, this, is, this is not really the sort of logic that is truly appropriate to deal with computer security problems. My own number four recommendation for, uh, in terms of security would be instead um, know thyself, know your threat models, know your attack surface, and know your blast radius. You know, just that. It, the, the very fact that you know yourself you know uh, how is it that you are even exposed in the first place and the sort of things that can happen uh, goes a long way in preventing those problems. You know, knowledge in terms of computer security is, is the key. And um, my own recommendation number five would be computer security is a culture, not a process and not a solution. And that's just as a reminder that uh, fundamentally no checklist of any kind is going to do any good to your company in the long run. This is a culture. We will get be getting back to that. Security inversion is just um, an observation of mine when it comes to computer security. Essentially, it seems that our, uh, our intuitive expectations in terms of role models, who should I trust, who should I look to when it comes to um, computer security, seems to be invariably wrong. Um, organization that appears the most secure uh, on, the, on the outside uh, or in terms of appearance are typically the worst. And uh, on the contrary, organization that looks very gray or very shady are actually the best. And this, this is the essence of this small paradox that, we will, that, we will, that I will clarify in a minute of this security inversion. By way of um, anecdotal evidence, I would like to, to, to point out this talk from 2014, which are pulling the curtain on airport security. And this talk, those two security sh researchers, show that in terms of computer security, um, airports are really, really bad. I mean, it is the, the security is so bad that it's even ludicrous. It is almost like it would almost be comical if it wasn't, you know, uh, uh, so serious. And and, and that's the exact opposite of what you would expect. You would expect you know, international exports to benefit from incredibly tight computer security. And this is the exact opposite. The, uh, the, the uh, computer security is literally a complete joke. And this is uh, and what those security researchers show that it, it's not like one vulnerability. It's like a, an encyclopedia of vulnerabilities. And, and most of those problems being of the worst kind, you know, where you demonstrate everything, you know, complete incompetence, complete lack of care, complete apathy to the problem, etc., etc., etc. And 
this talk uh, that was given uh, a few years ago really matched my own uh, professional experience. In, indeed, as a, uh, as a professional hobby, I have been conducting um, technological audits um, on behalf of investment firms for, uh, for more than a decade now. And so I have I had the chance to audit um, dozens of, uh, of essentially tech companies. And my observation is that uh, the more, I would say, the more secure, I would say, the appearance or the context of the company, the uh, crappier their actual comp computer security seems to be. And thus, for example, companies that operate in fields of literally defense and security in general tends to have incredibly bad security, while on the contrary, companies that operate, I would say, in gray areas, um, such as uh, betting websites, um, adult websites, you know, these sort of things that are in the gray zone, um, tend to have, on the contrary, excellent computer security. And, and, um, and the interesting thing is that the, there is the very same problems even happen within one, in one specific industry. For example, in healthcare, uh, I, I had the chance to witness that the sort of security that is involved for the device used by a surgeon during the operation is completely dismal, while uh, the, uh, the sort of computer security that goes on for the vending machine that is in the hall of the hospital to be actually quite good. Um, so you, you would think, you know, intuitively that whatever goes in um, the, the, the room where um, the surgery takes place must be incredibly secure because obviously the, the patient life is at stake, but the opposite is true and the vending, the vending machine is way more secure than um, the, the devices used by the surgeon. And thus, this is, and so you see we have this, this counterintuitive inversion at play. And I believe that the, the root cause for this inversion is just a simple matter of Darwinism. Um, if, you see, no airport ever went, you know, away, no international airport ever went away or bankrupt due to the fact that they had uh, a massive computer security problems. Um, there, those, those, air, those international airports are not even allowed to fail. And thus, they can get away with... Uh, um, massive secu uh, ongoing uh, computer security problems for years with uh, an impressive degree of apathy. On the contrary, if you happen to be running, let's say, a company uh, th uh, that operates uh, an online betting you know, app, then if you let hackers uh, exfiltrate money from, uh, from your website, just because they can change you know, the outcomes of the bets and, uh, and take money from, uh, from you and, and the players, then you're not going to last long and nobody will come to your rescue to, um, to, to, to save you. And thus, as a result, uh, those people are essentially survivors. They are the people who did manage to do everything that, it was, that, that was needed to actually secure the systems. And thus, for supply chain, I think the key takeaway here is that if you are looking for genuine uh, computer security help to assist you to secure your supply chain. Um, do not look for, um, I would say, ex-military official with impeccable credentials, you know. Um, instead, look for some kind of system administrator of, of somebody who was involved with an adult website of some kind of, you know, online betting. Those sort of fringe area where People really needed skills and talent and dedication to survive, otherwise the, 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 the company would not even have, you know, uh, would have ceased to exist under, uh, uh, under their, um, their watch. Also, as, as a final part of, uh, about what can be done in terms of computer security, I would like to outline the role of design when it comes to computer security. Um, when it comes to computer security, many so-called experts would tell you that you need to train your teams. And personally, I'm not so sure in the sense that you cannot train people not to do mistakes. Even you know, the smartest people are going to be tired, are going to be sick, and are going to do very stupid mistakes once in a while. So you, you cannot rely really on, um, on, on training. And again, computer security is not like military security. You cannot just, you know, go, let people 
through a super intense training so that they can operate on instinct, um, most of the problem really needs you to be calm and to think really hard about what is going on. Otherwise, again, the remediation is most likely to be worse than the problem that you had in the first place. And that's my, uh, my, my take is that when I say design is that if you have a design problem in your organization, uh, when it comes to computer security, no amount of training or duct tape is going to fix the problem. It's going to be a battle that you cannot win. Thus, um, when you take things from the design perspective, you're looking for decisions or aspects that can have a massive impact on threat models, on attack surface, and on blast radius. And you, you want to take design decisions that literally eliminates as far as much as possible entire classes of threat models that eliminates entire attack surfaces that, that really, really constrain the sort of, of blast reduce that you can have. For example, if, um, if we are talking about attack surface, what can you do? What, what sort of, of design decisions can be involved? Well, if, for example, your organization is picking software vendors with RFPs, requests for proposal, or RFQs, requests for quotes, then um, you can be assured that you're going to have massive computer security problems. As a, as a design, it's going to be by design, just due to the RFPs, RFQs. Why is that? Well, it's because if you select enterprise software vendors based on RFPs, or RFQs, um, you are selecting uh, vendors who are going to be able to tick all the boxes because invariably there will be tons of boxes to be ticked. You know, uh, typical supply chain RFP is going to have you know, hundreds of, uh, of boxes to be ticked. And those boxes are, can your software do this? Can your software do that? Can it do this and that? And thus, when you drive uh, your picking of enterprise software vendor through an RFP, what you're actually selecting are vendors that have massively bloated products with tons of features, tons of capabilities. But then you're also actively selecting vendors that have, by design, a massive attack surface. You know, as I was saying, the more capabilities, the more features, the, more at the, the greater the attack surface. And thus, if, if it happens that every single software vendor that you pick is picked through this sort of process, then what you, what you end up with is an applicative landscape that has an insanely large uh, attack surface at the, uh, at the end of the day, or, or rather at the end of the decade, because you know, those are slow moving problems as far as supply chain are concerned. And then um, the same sort of, of design decisions can also uh, have massive impact on, on blast reduces, for example. Uh, the, for example, the way you even approach data has uh, fairly dramatic consequences. From, uh, from a supply chain perspective, um, most of the personal data is simply completely useless to perform any kind of uh, supply chain optimization. So if you want to, to have better forecasts, better planning, you don't, know to, you don't need to know, you know the first name and last name of your, uh, of your customers. And thus, um, the idea, and that's, that's, by the way, a practice that LOCAD did adopt um, essentially more than a decade ago, is our, our practice is LOCAD being uh, a, a software vendor in the realm of, uh, I would say, um, software uh, supply chain optimization. Uh, our, our policy is to make sure that we are never the recipient of any kind of personal data, and because we see personal data as a liability, not as an asset. And in terms of blast regions, it means that if, um, if this or those systems ever get breached, and when they will be breached, well, the blast regions will be much, slow, much smaller, if only because, well, um, the, the personal data, which tends to be the ones that are very critical, and the sort of data that can really get you into lawsuits, will not be leaked. And, um, and yes, it's pretty bad if all your stock levels are publicly exposed, but it's not going to be, you know, this sort of data is not going to have, uh, I would say, very much a big impact, a very big negative impact on your company, which is not the case of the personal data. That's again, this is a, 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 design, uh, a design aspect about how to organize your supply chain can have, you know, massive consequence in terms of, of blast reduces. 
And the very best design decisions are the ones that eliminate you know, entire classes of problems, entire classes of rules. And, and here, the role of culture, of, of having the role of uh, a computer security culture in the company is um, to let your, in your organization emerge the correct insight about what should be the design decision that should be made to uh, help protect your company. So you see, design decision, the, de the correct design insight are the product, but what can generate you know, those, those design decisions is a proper culture about computer security. And this brings me to the conclusion uh, that computer security is essentially too important to be left to the sole hands of IT specialists. Computer security is best approached as a culture within the company. Uh, and this is a shared responsibility. This is not just the responsibility of the people who happen to have the security keyword in their job title. And as we did see in uh, the very beginning of this lecture is that computer security is very frequently competing against other kind of security uh, inside your company. And thus, it is an illusion to think that uh, a, a computer security specialist may save you. Um, this computer security specialist may only you know, address one facet of the problem. And that's why culture is as actually essential to foster the emergence of the sort of um, design decision that will you know, bring great security benefits to your company. But also, uh, the right culture is essential to instinctively reject the very, very bad decisions, very ba bad design decision that would uh, create, I would say, ongoing stream of problems that, we not, that you won't be able to fix afterwards. So you see, it's having a great culture of security is not just about what you should do, but also what about what you should not do. And one of the most difficult aspects of a healthy computer security culture is um, to get employees care sufficiently about the problem so that they are not satisfied with the appearance of security. Um, you see, a, a healthy computer security culture, in a healthy computer security culture, people are looking for genuine security, uh, not just uh, the appearance of security. And the illusion of security is, um, uh, is very uh, frequently much worse than an actual lack of security. Very well, so this, is, uh, this was the last lecture of, um, of 2021. Um, the next lecture will take place in 2022. It will be same day of the week. And the next lecture, in the next lecture, I will start the chapter number fifth. That is about, um, about forecasting. And in particular, I, it will be, uh, I believe, a fairly interesting presentation because LOCAT did manage to uh, did manage a very spectacular achievement in the M5 forecasting competition, and they are so I will be first presenting these results, but uh, I will also be presenting all the sort of lessons that are attached to this model as far as supply chain is concerned. Thus, let me have a look at the um, at the questions. Um, so, a first question from Jess Bankston. In general, do supply chain, leader, uh, supply chain leaders consider cybersecurity irrelevant for them or not my problem thing? Um, and I believe that, yes, I mean, to, to a large extent, uh, but it can be worse than that. It is Indeed, the fact that not my problem is, uh, is very prevalent and, and I believe very, very misguided. But even when um, supply chain leaders do care, they tend to approach um, computer security uh, from a, a, a risk analysis perspective, from the perspective that would be applicable for industrial risk. You see, uh, again, that was why I was, you know, um, I was actually criticizing quite severely the recommendation number five about the, uh, of the FBI, where the FBI says, um, exercise your response plan. You know, this is exactly the sort of things that you want to do for an, industri uh, for an industrial risk. 
Um, it is not the sort of thing that is naturally, you know, uh, most efficient when it comes to uh, cyber security. Um, thus, thus, you see, I would say, yes, apathy, apathy is a big problem, but even when people care, they tend to approach the problem from the wrong angle, and um, they can even make the problem worse, because again, uh, this is this thing about computer security, is that if you do not have the proper remediation, you tend to make problem worse. Um, for example, if, uh, if, I, if I have just to give one example about uh, passwords, many companies implement password rotations because they think, oh, passwords can be compromised. So, in, and, and indeed, they are. So what should we do? Well, we are going to rotate the passwords, and there is many companies that implement mandatory password recommendation. However, it is now firmly established that actually uh, pass mandatory password ro rotations weaken security. And there was even a report from the NSA uh, in the USA that was pointing out that please, do, it was intended to the other security organization, uh, uh, please stop having those mandatory password rotation policies. You are, you are actually decreasing your amount of security. Um, and, and the reason is very simple. If you force people to rotate passwords, let's say every month, what will happen is that people will start having the new password as a post-it on their desk uh, for everybody to see. You see, again, even if you train people not to do that, that will be you know, the, 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 the easiest things to do, and thus many people will do it. And then people will reuse over and over, rotate over a series of three passwords and whatnot. Um, that, so that explains, you know, that so my point in conclusion is that supply chain leaders absolutely do not care enough about what can destroy their supply chain nowadays. And, uh, and they really have to familiarize themselves so that if they start paying attention, they apply the right sort of remediation. Second question from Alexei Tikhanov. As um, uh, cyber security is on the rise, I, I didn't say that cyber security is on the rise. I said that cyber crime is on the rise. I hope that at some point cyber security will be on the rise. Uh, I'm not too sure. Companies' investment in this industry grows faster than, than their budget for other software. Um, yes, it's true. Is there a possibility that in the future um, the benefits of having a software system is counterbalanced by large costs for cybersecurity and people fall back uh, to pen and paper again? Uh, uh, this is a very interesting question. Um, as I was saying, you see, because cybercrime is on the rise, uh, people feel the pressure and thus there is money to be s that are spent on cybersecurity solutions. And indeed, even the FBI recommend uh, to actually invest in some kind of security solution. So I'm pretty sure that the lobbyist mani who managed to have this line inserted in the top five recommendation got <laughs> a very big bonus. But um, you see, my problem, my, the problem that I have with those security solutions is that security cannot be an afterthought. Most of it is by design. You know, if your company is selecting software based on RFPs, you have a problem at the very core of your company, which is you are selecting enterprise software vendors that are going to be exceedingly crappy security-wise. Thus, it doesn't matter if afterward you decide to uh, invest in some kind of fancy security solution. It is too late. By design, you are compromised. You see, that the thing is that you cannot, um, again, if I go back to this medieval castle analogy, if you realize that your drawbridge has a weakness, well, you just kind of engineer a moat, a bigger moat on top of the, uh, of the drawbridge, or if the walls, you realize that the walls are, are not high enough, you can, you can you know, make the, the, the walls of the, uh, of the medieval castle a little bit higher, or you, know, you can add differences. And by the way, this is where it was done you know, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the medieval era. Most of those castles did grow over time. They, didn't, they, were, they weren't you know, built at once. Um, so, you, so the idea of having additive layers of security, if you're dealing with physical risk, it works. In, in software, it doesn't work. Usually when you add software, you're just making the problem worse. The security problems, if you have the, the more lines of code, the bigger your security problem. If you keep adding lines of code, you're just having, 
you're just getting yourself into a bigger security problem. Um, so, so first, that's why I'm, um, I see that, yes, I agree, c c cyber crime is on the rise. I agree that cyber security, if you, if you measure cyber security as the amount of money being spent on those vendors is on the rise, but the amount of, of true security, you know, if there was such a thing, such as, uh, you know, a ratio between the sort of um, reported losses in cybercrime versus GDP, this thing is actually getting worse. So we, we have less cybersecurity while we are spending more to fight it. Um, now, so so um, that's the problem. And then can we go back to pen and paper? That's an intriguing idea. Um, I don't think, I don't think that um, the world is going to go back to the pre-digital era, as I was saying in the intro, um, the, 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 the cost of doing so is just too great. You know, the, the, the benefits brought by software are absolutely gigantic. And, and even, you know, if we said that cybercrime is fairly big, you know, in the end, it's still with this a relatively, you know, 10 years projection of plus 30% a year, we are still talking of a problem that has only, in terms of order of magnitude, that is still, you know, one third of the illegal drug problems. And, uh, and, uh, and illegal drugs are, you know, a very big problem, but it's not, it's not the end of our industrial civilization. And people, uh, and, and, and so my take is that people will not be getting back to pen and papers, however, what I suspect is that many software vendors are learning to go back to, um, I would say, to, to, to uh, much simpler technological solutions. If I want to illustrate that point, uh, uh, it turned out that, for example, with the log4j vulnerability, you know, this, this, this vulnerability that, that hit the world and, and, and wrote havoc through you know, um, uh, all the big players and pretty much every single company, wa large company was impacted by this supply chain attack related to vulnerability related to log4j. Why do we have this problem? We have this problem because this component, log4j, is actually incredibly complex and incredibly capable. So normally it should be a tiny piece of software that should be just able to log errors. But it turned out that it's actually kind of a beast in terms of software capabilities and people just discovered a way to exploit the beast to, do, to uh, achieve fairly unintended consequences. And thus, for example, at Locad, we are not using log4j. Uh, our stack is in .NET. We're using you know, the, um, the equivalent component in the .NET stack, which is nlog. But uh, with my CTO, when we were thinking about, we were looking at all the problems that were unfolding on the, I would say, I within this Java community, our decision was to essentially, at some point, phase out nlog to go for something that would ha be much, much simpler, where um, it will not be a better nlog. It will just be something that has only 1% of the complexity because we are, indeed, those loggers are incredibly capable but, uh, but to a point that all those capabilities becomes you know, a, 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 a big liability. So what I see is that the, the, the equivalent of going for pen and paper would be to start replacing very powerful and very complex piece of software with um, software pieces that are much smaller and much less capable just to kind of alleviate the burden of, uh, of, of the security cost. You see, at some point it becomes clear that it's cheaper to re-implement a small piece of software that just do what you need, even if you have to kind of reinvent the wheel, as opposed to take a component that is free on the, uh, you know, open source on the market, but then incur all the massive uh, extra attack surface um, just because this is a very, very big component. Another question from Jess Bengtsson. Uh, were some of the larger known attacks impacting supply chain related to specialized supply chain, so, uh, uh, where, uh, sorry, were some of the larger known attacks impacting supply chain related to specialized supply chain software versus general use enterprise software system? Uh, I mean, for example, the, uh, We have many biases here. Um, the problem is that the attacks that make the news are, you know, 
by a selection process are the attacks that kind of attack that tends to touch all industries. Log4j is um, was such a massive worldwide problem because essentially uh, the 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 log4 shell vulnerability was impacting banking, supply chain, cloud computing providers, uh, game companies, uh, everything was was kind of impacted, and thus it made the news. Um, uh, and it, so, however, if I go back to the colonial pipeline attack, it was an attack, ransomware attack, that was um, very specifically targeted to one specific piece of software, one very specific billing piece of software. Thus, uh, my uh, so what I see is that the sort of attacks that make the news are the one that gets a lot of coverage, uh, but. It doesn't mean that it's because those attacks, th those attacks are not specific of supply chain, that they are not tons of attacks that succeed um, targeting specific supply chain systems. And while I cannot disclose you know, any elements um, about the, the, the Locat customer base, um, I, I have witnessed among the Locat customer base, so Locat customer base is about 100 plus companies that operate you know, on Locat, and when those companies suffer, um, let's say, a ransomware attack, it tends to be obvious for us because we don't get any data for a week or two while they are struggling to basically remedy the situation, typically restoring the system from scratch with their backups. And, uh, and sometimes Locad end up in the unfortunate situation of being the only backup that they had. Um, this is not exactly the prime function of Locad. But so what I do see is that uh, severe attacks targeted at supply chain systems are happening. And they are happening quite frequently because with a fairly small sample, you know, Locad has 100 plus companies as clients, but it's not like if we had a million. And even with that, uh, I would say that right now we are seeing about half a dozen of major accidents per year. That would be you know, sort, of, um, sort of, uh, of, of frequency. So, you know, a 5% risk annualized for a major uh, cybersecurity incident is, um, is a pretty high risk in my book. That would be, I'm not sure if it really addresses this question, but that would be a sort of element that I have. Another question from Chris Peterson. It seems that cybersecurity uh, becomes the digital analog of personal hygiene. Do you think that uh, schools should start teaching kids about those skills? Yes. Um, I mean, yes, I get your point. I get your point about hygiene. However, again, in cybersecurity, the attackers are smart. Yes, um, you know, real-life real viruses mutates, and uh, it's very difficult to contain them, and pathogens in, in, in uh, you know, pathogens in, uh, I, that, are, that are living being tends to, you know, evade most of um, the measure that we try to have, you know, from the medicine to contain them. However, um, uh, th there is a real difference between having, you know, something that is essentially, uh, um, I would say, a mindless attack versus to have some people that will going to attack you and that can really think hard and long about how to do the most damage to you and your company. So, um, the, so I agree that there is, there is a, a challenge to actually teach and train people, and why not children? By the way, uh, my personal belief is that you know, a child at the age of, um, of, of 12 is essentially as smart as an adult, and I have a, I have a, I have a, I have a daughter of the corresponding age, uh, it's just that this person, this, this young mind, just doesn't have the, all the luggage that an adult has. But in terms of raw um, intellect, I would say it's, it's on par with an adult. Um, so, so yes, clearly, this is the sort of things um, that are needed. But more generally, you know, it's not just about computer security. It's also about frauds. For example, I did not disclose, but a big part of the problem are um, social engineering schemes. Uh, there are still tons of people that falls um, victim to very obvious scams where you know somebody send you an email about being a prince in Nigeria and whatnot you know that uh, Nigerian scams um, so so yes I, I agree that <laughs> um, schools are uh, are still not doing anything to prepare 
uh, young minds and younger generation to affront a world that is fairly adversarial, where they will, uh, even if we live in a fairly, you know, um, uh, if we lived in a fairly peaceful civilization, although everything is relative, but still it's for most people around the world at this point of time, it is relatively peaceful. Um, there are uh, people that wish you ill, and the key aspect uh, of cybersecurity is that a person that wish you ill can be, you know, thousands of kilometers away from you and still manage to do damage to you and your organization and your relative and everything. So, yes, I think at some point it will, but again, um, to my knowledge, uh, at least in France, it is still a struggle to find teachers who can teach basic programming skills. Um, so, and this is a very ongoing struggle. So if, um, if it is a struggle to find teachers who have even, you know, modest programming skills, to find teachers that can say anything that would make any sense in terms of cybersecurity and, uh, and general, you know, digital security to children will be uh, an incredible undertaking. Nevertheless, it should probably be done, but uh, I don't have any hope uh, in this area for, for the next decade. Uh, another uh, a question, uh, no, there was no other question. Okay, um, I guess see you all uh, next year, and uh, I wish you all Merry Christmas. See you next time.